I want to tell you a secret. I love God with every fiber of my being. I have from the time I can remember. In the deepest part of me, age two, I knew God was there. And by age four, I knew that my allegiance in life was to God above all. People ask, what gets you up in the morning? God. Allah, we have entered the morning, and the kingdom has awakened for you, Lord of the worlds. I beg of you the good of this day, the light of it, the help of it, the guidance of it, and the victory of it. And I seek protection in you from whatever evil is in it, and whatever evil comes after it. Amen. Allah is in the things I say and the things I don't. The things I wear and the things I don't. The things I eat, the things I don't. The things I drink, the things I don't. Where I go, where I won't. But more than all of that, Allah is in how I love you. I love you. خداوند اول از رای چادر بیب جانم فهمیدم اما روز که بیب جانم مرد من می فهمیدم پس خاطر که مو شو هاو دیده بودم که دندانای مفتیره بود I met God through my grandmother's veil The day when بیب جان my grandmother died I knew she would That night I had a dream that my top two teeth had fallen out When my mom called at seven in the morning I knew why and I couldn't get out of bed I didn't want the day to happen. I refused to be an active participant in the day that would take her away from me. Instead, I spent the next hour crying because I never asked her the right questions all along. The beauty of my family and death is that everyone cries visibly and unapologetically. At least we hid nothing in our love for her. Women came from all over to wash her body for burial. I stood at her right side and talked her through the experience. I met God through the vastness of faith, even in her death. Her faith had her prepare a bag for her own burial. Five white cloths with her favorite suras and duas handwritten all over it. Earth from all of her pilgrimages that she wanted to be buried with in her kafan. Rose water and petals. And what struck me the most were the little black threads she had cut up so they would lay on her eyelids like eyelashes combed with mascara. Even in death, her nudani face would glow like she had just prayed. I met God through my grandmother's death. I would re-meet her through rose water cream smelling napkins, the ones we would find folded, hidden up, hidden the couch cushions in little squares even after she was gone. I met God where faith religion and spirituality meet through my grandmother's veil. And among his wonders is this. He creates for you mates out of your own kind so that you might incline towards them. And he engenders love and tenderness between you. In this, behold, there are messages indeed for people who think. That's the verse? I don't think so, but it's pretty good, right? I'll take it.
Hi everyone. My name is Wazina, and we are so honored to be here tonight with you all um, to reclaim Claiming Williams with you all um, in our first trip out of New York City uh, for our Coming Out Muslim Project. Um, so I want to just identify a couple of folks who you can't see, but I need, we need. Um, we have Nate, um, Harry, Laura Marie, um, Brad here somewhere, so thank you all the four of you for being here making this happen with us right now. Um, so I never gave much thought to how or why I was queer. I always felt like my coming out was pretty anticlimactic because my understanding of my sexual orientation is how I imagine heteros know they're straight. You, you like who you like. I know I liked who I liked. I found who I found attractive. It wasn't a big deal. It just seemed like everybody else needed a theory or an explanation for why I was queer. So, um, I have selected my favorite four theories um, that explain why I'm queer. Theory number one, Boy George made me queer. <laughs> take, I'll take it. My parents Americanized and assimilated with the help of a briefcase full of cassette tapes that my dad found when he worked at JFK Airport. So our home had tapes um, with household names like Ahmad Zayed, Naim Popal, the Eurythmics, and Boy George. <laughs> Synthesizers and keyboard, Afghan and New Wave, informed my musical tastes. Pasty faces, red lipstick, thick eyeliner, Surman bangles, Afghan bride, or Rob Smith from The Cure. I'm pretty sure it's what contributed to my queerness. Okay, fine, maybe just my aesthetic. When I was 14, it was no surprise to anyone when I asked to see Boy George and the Culture Club with the Human League at Radio City Music Hall. I had won the right to ask um, to go with high grades rounding out my ninth grade year, and my mother was my date. I was so excited. My excitement, however, was not enough to have me dance in front of her, and I was grateful that there were seats, because any sway of my hips would be blackmail material for years, forcing me to dance with my uncles and cousins at family gatherings. After the set by the Human League, we watched the crowds. And then, suddenly, there was this flood of like drag queens, party kids, and gender benders taking their seats. Maybe they were there the entire time and we were like oblivious to them. They became visible, slowly fading into my mother's realization that there might be gay people here. Wazina, why are there so many gay people here? Boy George gay ass, not me for me? Boy George is gay, don't you know that? As my mother realizes gayness exists in this form and fashion in America, I realize that my parents aren't actually sympathetic to queers. I realize it's not that my parents feel a common connection with queers because they're immigrants. They just have no read on queerness because they are immigrants. Theory number two, because I equated boys with hellfire, made me queer. It is a sunny afternoon in our sixth floor apartment in Queens, in the bedroom with the stucco walls. I'm six years old and I'm eagerly listening to my parents tell me what heaven and hell are like. I am deathly afraid, but cannot rip myself away from what they have to say. It takes 40 years to walk the width of hell. Boba, my dad, tells me that on Judgment Day, Gabriel's horn will blow, and I'm beginning to panic because what if I don't hear it? We will all be lined up, he says, naked, because each one of us is equals in the eyes of God. Our life stories we pulled up on a screen, and a list will be made of all of our good deeds and wrongdoings. God sees everything we do, and he will blow up my spot to the rest of humanity, everyone, even Mrs. McDonald, my kindergarten teacher. Boba then shares what is likely the most foundational moment in both of our lives. He tells me I'm not allowed to ever have a boyfriend. This is not something that we did. Immediately, the fires of hell swallowed whole my future hypothetical boyfriend. Goodbye, sweet prince. I never knew you. I think I tried to outsmart them and ask about marriage, and my mom has this answer ready. 
and she tells me she will help me pick up my husband when the time comes. My dad also chimes in with what is likely too advanced to tell a six-year-old me or any six-year-old. Eight minutes of pleasure is not worth a lifetime in hell. <laughs> and then I'm beginning to think, even if I have a boyfriend, have sex with him and get away with it, even a naked Paula Abdul will watch my eight minutes of sin on the large screen. <laughs> After our talk, I cannot believe I will tell you this. After our talk, I cannot help myself from seducing and kissing this red velvet couch that we had. <laughs> the couch is the sort of embodiment of Kit, the voice from the car in Knight Rider, who I, right, so Kit is who I imagined my lover lost to be. Hello, my name is Tana, and uh, as Wazina said, we're so honored to be here uh, today and to share um, this experience with you. So I'm half Nigerian, half Liberian, and um, after college, I decided I wanted to go home to Nigeria for a year. So my mother had spent the better part of an hour coaching me in the fine art of packing. This was just a short visit home before my big trip back to Nigeria. As she examined every piece of clothing I intended to take with me for my year-long voyage, I only half listened knowing that she was gonna win out with packing wisdom in the end. I was ready to get into the groove of preparation and I knew that this was her way of helping. What kind of clothes are you taking? You can't just dress any way you want. It's not America. People will notice. Where are you going with these trousers? I love my cotton organic trousers. Those are nice trousers. It's going to be hot. I said to myself. <laughs> and on we went, her talking aloud and me talking to myself. You better not chase people's daughters over there, oh, she yells, suddenly, 20 minutes later. What are you talking about? I reply, mortified. I know you're ACDC, and I'm telling you, African people don't do that kind of thing. <laughs> Whew. My heart begins to race. What the hell is she talking about? I am insulted. Does my mother think all queer people are lascivious predators? It is the homo monster of hetero imagining, the lewd-eyed masculine, meaning not properly dressed enough to be a respectable woman, monster. Lock your doors! Return to your tribal roots! Only allow your daughters out to work the land and cook until a suitable suitor arrives. And when he does, hail his broad, manly chest and deep voice. Or, lacking those, hail a worthy dowry. Hetero desire, or at least hetero activity, will keep the homo monster at bay. I'm not stupid, I say, as disgustedly as possible. The truth is that chasing after anyone's daughter is the last thing on my mind. But is there something in what she says we're thinking about? Am I a monster because I'm queer? I know queer originally means strange, odd, but does it mean otherworldly creature? I don't think so. I'm not saying you're stupid. I'm telling you that African people don't believe in homosexuality, bisexuality, whatever. White people brought that thing with them. It is not natural for Africans. Hmm. Is this true? 
was the continent homo-free until white people started colonizing? <laughs> Am I indeed the homo monster of legend? So, I just found out that so-and-so at the mosque is a lesbian. That tells you they aren't following the teachings. It's about a code of virtues. They mix the teachings with other things. So, I am a Sufi, which means I follow the path of mysticism in Islam. And uh, this is the story of how I became a dervish. About four years ago, I went to Jerusalem for a friend's wedding. And Jerusalem is the third holiest city in all of Islam. This is the place that Muhammad was taken, and he was taken up through seven heavens in the night of the mirage. Uh, and that's where Salat, the prayer, comes from. And so, so magnificent was this journey that even the rock that he was on wanted to go with him. And it came off the ground in longing. So this is where I'm going, to the Dome of the Rock. So I'm thinking, this is going to be amazing. My life is going to change. I'm going to have some ginormous revelation. I'll come back a changed person. My whole life will be different. And so one day, I roll up to the gate, and they look me up and down. I don't look Muslim. And so they test me. Recite some Quran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Kul huwa Allahu ahad. Allahu samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakun lahu kufu an ahad. And I'm wearing some, some capris that don't quite make it to the ankle. So they give me the most uncomfortable skirt I have ever worn. And Lord only knows where it had been before. <laughs> so I step in to my very uncomfortable skirt. And I walk. I'm waiting for it. Revelation is coming any minute now. My life is going to change. So I get to the mosque. And I pray. I'm sitting and I'm waiting. And the only thing I can hear is, all of this is already inside of you. This message just keeps coming to me over and over again. And I'm like, well, I don't know what that means. So on to the rock. Maybe at the rock, my revelation is coming. So I go to this amazing place where the rock itself came out the ground. There's a hair of the prophet. Peace be upon him. And I'm ready for it. I reach out, I touch the rock, and nothing. All of this is already inside of me. So I leave, and I, I'm confused. I thought my life was going to change, and it hasn't. So seven months later, back in New York City, I meet this man who says something about zikr, dervish, Sufi, words that are very confusing to me. He says, I can't really explain any of this. You just have to come. Come to the mosque. And so I go. And as soon as I open the door, it hits me. The smell, the sound, the names. Yahai, 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 Yahai. And I understand all of this already inside of me. I took hand with my Sheikha in 2008.
was younger, um, instead of praying five times a day to God, I would write to God instead, setting my intentions and praying the best way I knew how on humble little scraps of paper, tissue, whatever. I would write to God and ask him to keep buildings from falling on the people that I loved. I prayed for my agency and liberation, for love to find me and give me my first kiss and make me feel like I was normal and then alleviate the guilt for any possible sacrilege that I had committed. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 years old. I did once write an official letter to God on a notepad that I placed in a small window in the window of my basement bedroom. In my letter, I asked God to prove himself to me. Um, I asked him to prove himself to me by giving me the answer in my science class. And then, you know, of course, also tell me his mission and vision for my life. <laughs> that easy. Um, so I put the letter on a, I wrote the letter on a piece of paper, no letterhead, scratch a couple things out here and there, put it in the window. At night, when my dad would be, was taking out the trash, he would usually peek into my window to make sure my curtains were closed so that no perverts could come in. This is America, after all. Most nights, he'd find me in a couple of compromising states, up against a wall in a prolonged handstand, obsessively doing crunches, or sitting in my bedroom listening to Portishead in the background. Or something off Depeche Mode's violator. Probably. Um, I put the letter there, and you see the next morning, I get a response. But instead of being excited and overjoyed that I had communicated with God, I feel a hot shame rush through me like I was, like when you've been caught in a lie or when you've wet yourself. That feeling of hotness and shame rushing through you. The response was in my dad's handwriting. And the reply said, Don't lose faith, my child. I wanted to cry because I was so ashamed. And for two main reasons. Reason number one, my dad now knew I questioned God and everything he'd ever taught me and passed on to me. And two, he would now know that I asked God to prove himself to me by giving me the answer in my eighth grade earth science class. I was terribly embarrassed and ashamed. I kid you not. Not only was I a non-believer, but his oldest daughter was also dumb. <laughs> People ask God to deepen their faith and appear and give them cures to diseases, get them through arduous life tasks. I asked for one right answer. I threw out the note that morning, my dad's handwriting, and swore to never mention it or discuss it, ever. The next day in Mr. Rosenthal's science class, sitting next to Joy Kim, I raised my hand and had an answer, the right answer, sedimentary rocks. And maybe God did write me back that night because he sent me Boba, who had faith enough in both me and Allah. So was, mm -hmm. you wrote a letter to God and I wrote one to Muhammad. Tell Dearest me. Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it feels a bit scandalous to write you a letter, but you've come to me in dreams twice now. And they say that if someone sees you in a dream, it's as if they've really seen you. So I figure if I've really seen you, surely you wouldn't mind a letter. I don't know if I love you right, or with sufficient appreciation or reverence. I know simply that I love you, imperfectly in the face of the gift of you, the crown jewel of humanity which you embody or point the way to. Ya Rasulullah, Ya Habibullah, you are the soul. And I have questions, so much I wish to ask of you understand, reconcile your divine nature, your human life. Sometimes I imagine I'm one of the companions. What I would ask you is, what was it like when revelation came? That feeling that your chest would explode. Cool! And what did you do when Jibril departed? Was there sweat on your brow? 
Did you think all that time in a cave had finally driven you mad? What first words did you utter to Khadija? And what was it like in the years that followed, knowing that Allah had made you adore? More than that, knowing that Allah loved you, had fashioned your heart from the beginning of hearts and souls and time. Knowing you signified both a beginning and an end, a seal, the completion of revelation to all humanity. You, a man, merely a man. Did you ever cry with the strain of it? And what was it like being so beautiful? Did women cut themselves paring fruit, distracted by your beauty the way they did with Yusuf? What was it like smelling like roses all the time? look Muslim or Afghan do you pray five times a day does your mom wear a burqa are you Sunni or Shia do you wear black because of your religion how does your family feel about you being gay since Afghanistan is in Asia why don't you look Chinese have you ever read the kite runner Why don't you wear the veil? When are you going to do your pilgrimage? What? Can you actually, actually be, be gay, gay and, and Muslim? Muslim? Queer theory number three. I never got the birds and the bees talk, and that made me queer. I'm a sex educator now, um, but growing up, we never talked about puberty or periods. My body was like one huge science experiment, like a potato and a cup of water sprouting, but no real use of the scientific method. But luckily, I wasn't alone. My cousins Katara and Nazanin and I were in it together. We read YM magazine in the library and then shared out the knowledge we had picked up. And mostly we just wove together tatters of misinformation we picked up from our mothers and 
uh, really young and hip aunt Bin Azid. We were the blind leading the blind. There was the time Katara thought she could hatch a chicken egg. She placed the two eggs in the warmest, most womb-like spot on her 12-year-old body, her armpits. We sat there and watched her sit with them gently cushioned under her pits. It was summer and like likely 90 degrees outside, contributing to the human incubator she had become. Later that day, when the eggs broke, she swore she saw the heartbeat. Our parents, clearly, did not teach us about the birds and the bees. The next year, we did acquire some information about where babies came from. You prayed for them. You prayed so hard that, at some point, God granted your prayers. And this made a lot of sense to us. We grew up in households where there was no affection expressed between our parents. Sometimes they didn't even sleep in the same bed. And I was never even sure if they loved each other. So clearly, Babies came from passionate prayer and not passionate physical acts. And so Katera prayed, and at 13, she told us she was pregnant. She just knew she was pregnant. And if God was going to pick any one of us three, it would probably be her. I don't really remember how we solved that mystery, but something else was totally clear. Immaculate conception wasn't just something white people and Catholics feared. It was and is the weight I would carry for years because, of course, I would be the queer Muslim girl who would carry the next baby Jesus and likely no one would believe me, not even you. <laughs> Theory number four. Because I had no female friends in high school made me queer. This one is my dad's theory. During my high school years at Bayside High School in Queens, I was surrounded by boys, lots of them. I landed myself a secure role as queen of club nerd. My ruling male counterparts were also overachieving first-generation children of immigrant parents. Randy was Chinese and all about dragon boat racing. He was the business manager of the school paper and had a type A personality. Eugene was my not-so-secret Korean crush. His dad was a pastor and he had the highest SAT scores in the entire school. Dalipa was born in Russia to Sri Lankan parents. His dad worked for the UN, and in sixth grade we had a dance together um, in the school play. Awkward boy-girl touching tied us together as really close friends through elementary, junior, and high school. The list went on. My parents didn't lecture me about having guy friends or make me feel bad at all. And by then, I knew I liked girls, which I think made it easy to, A, maintain guy, guy friends. In a narrow way, I told myself, it's easy to relate to guys. We both like girls. But really, I think it was option B that kept our friendship platonic. Much like myself, these guys had bought into the white standard of beauty. Rather than wear makeup three shades too light and carry a parasol each day like I did, they coveted white girls, not me. I just wanted to be one. A couple of years ago, when my dad was complaining to my siblings about my gayness, he theorized that my girlfriend at the time was the first girl to ever give her attention. Right, Boba. Somehow, in my girl attention starved brain and being, I was lulled, oh, nay, brainwashed, into a girl on girl, same gender loving relationship. Right, Boba. But the truth is, Jess didn't make me gay. Rosie didn't make me gay. James from the Queer Student Union didn't make me gay. My mom not breastfeeding me didn't make me gay. Boy George didn't make me gay. Fran didn't make me gay. Feminism didn't make me gay. College did not make me gay. Allah made me gay. a little better. 
Being queer and Muslim is a gift. The kind of gift that when you get it and you first unwrap it, there's that moment or a month or a year or five years when you're not quite sure you want it. <laughs> and slowly you begin to recognize the wonder of it, the features and special features, the singularity of the gift. And it becomes the best gift you could have never asked for. And you thank Allah every day. For me, being both has never been a source of internal conflict. I was queer before I converted to Islam. And in converting or reverting, I made a clear, intentional choice to embrace Islam because it is the deen of my heart. I've never felt Islam asked me to be something other than what I am. If Allah is closer than my own jugular vein, is the creator, ya halak, ya bari, ya musawir, of my heart, the source of its blood and beat, how could I despise myself? It is true that the messages, the onslaught of homophobia, sometimes make me have to secretly reassure myself that Allah has blessed me abundantly, lovingly, generously. And every prayer I've ever prayed has been answered. This is my proof that the Most High has not forsaken me. Here's the truth. I do not love Islam with the sweetness of childhood honey. It was not the language of my mother's love for God. There were no Ramadans for me, no Eids. Instead, I loved Lent for the naked yearning in it. Those last three days of fasting, proof of devotion to the beloved. One day, my sophomore year of college, working the desk at the library, I'm sure some, some of y'all work at the library, that was my dream job at the time, I heard my supervisor, Scott, a tall, bespeckled American man who was a doctoral student in Near East Studies, talking about his time in Yemen. He had become Muslim there. I was fascinated by the mere sound of the word Islam. I went to Nigeria that year to visit family during Christmas, and it was Ramadan, and my fascination deepened at the sight of people breaking fast at sunset with oranges. When I got back to Chicago, I asked Scott to teach me about Islam. We would meet in the prayer room in the basement of the library once a week, and he taught me my first surah. He taught me about prayer. He, in his faith, moved me in a way I had not been moved before. He somehow was an outer manifestation of what I'd felt all along. Islam was my sacred container. After a while, he became uncomfortable with the me and him and a room alone thing and introduced me to a woman who met with me for several months and gave me my first prayer rug, which I still use. I fell in love completely. Islam is the language of my love, the expression of the oneness in my heart, which Islam has taught me to call Tawheed. 
I took Shahada in a masjid on 47th and Woodlawn on the south side of Chicago on Easter Sunday, April 16th, 2000. Scott picked me up so he could be my witness. The only thing I owned that vaguely, and I do mean vaguely, resembled a hijab was a piece of fabric I had brought back from Nigeria. You can laugh, it's okay. <laughs> it didn't look quite right. <laughs> but you couldn't tell me nothing that day. This is a rebirth. Go home and take a shower to mark a new beginning. Birds flying high, you know how I feel. Sun in the sky, you know how I feel. Breeze drifting on by, you know how I feel. It's a new dawn, it's a new day. It's a new life for me, yeah. It's a new dawn, it's a new day. It's a new life for me. My mother asked me this through tears and frustration in the food aisle where you can find the cinnamon sugar almonds, dried fruit, and nuts. This is in reaction to the boldest and most self-advocating answer I've ever given my mother. Two weeks earlier, I had long, wavy brown hair with honey brown highlights. I wore a pretty, pretty princess dress with the mother of the bride style jacket at my cousin Katera's wedding, the one with the eggs, and a bra stuffed to fill the in-between gaps taking me from a 32A to 34B. I kid you not. I was Posina. Posina is who my parents wanted the rest of the family to meet and see at this important event. One of the first weddings in our family since my grandmother's death. Posina was not acceptable for public display. She had short hair, a skinny frame with unremarkable breasts, visible, ta visible tattoos that only my mother knows about, a questionable style, taste, and clothing, warranting my mother pick out and haggle the price of the dress and fund the jacket making. Wazina was not going to be a contender in the parade and competition that my mom and all the women in my family had set up for their children, and so I played the role. I danced a lot. I wore traditional clothes and danced with the henna. I sat with my mom and sisters the entire time. I took pictures with Katara and her husband. I danced with my relatives. I had no problem with all of the above, and I did it all well. But the wig was undignified. What you need to know is that Afghan weddings are meat markets. Because I played up the dream so well, what I kept joking about actually came true. I got a suitor as a result of my role. A family friend in the wedding was impressed with my respectful coyness. She knew of another family who had a son who was in search of a wife roughly my age. So she made a phone call to my mom, who then phoned me on a Thursday afternoon while I was buying groceries. Fozina's acceptance by my family and feeling like this is who I'm meant to be makes me consider giving up everything. Everything I have been, want to be, and have wanted to be. Falling short of my family's vision as something other than as painful and lonesome. I know I'm loved, but not respected. When my mother asked me to meet the parents who were eager to meet me in person, read, assess me for themselves. And she asked me what I thought, and I said no. No, not now. No, not him. Or no, not ever. My answer, no, not ever.
she asks, no, not now, no, not him, or no, not ever. No, not ever. I cannot talk about religious celebrations and moments like Eid or weddings without talking about henna. It's a cultural expression and celebration of my faith. And so when I talk about coming out Muslim, I must talk about being Afghan, because it's difficult to draw the line between why my parents don't approve of my queerness. Is it because of our family? Is it about shame, cultural norms? Or is it because of their interpretation of the Quran? So, many queer Muslims I know avoid mosques, especially women, because it can be a little rough in somebody's basement or in five feet of space somewhere behind a screen. <coughs> And uh, that, in addition to the homophobia one might encounter, is a deterrent. Uh, but one year, uh, 2005, I had just come back after several years living in London. And it was Ramadan. And I love Ramadan. So I'd been going to this mosque on 55th Street for two weeks. We'd been going every day, and it had been beautiful. We had a little community going. We were cool behind our little screen. We had gotten to know each other a little bit. And so I thought, OK, mm -hmm, let me try to take this to the next level of comfort. And uh, I thought, OK, I'm going to pray the way I pray at home, which is usually uncovered or not wearing a scarf, maybe something, but not a scarf. So I had my little something that people put under their hijabs. So I slip it on. My hair is about this length. I stuff it all in there. A little bit of it is showing, but uh, I'm feeling it. The time to break fast has come. We've had our date. We're about to get our prayer on. It's beautiful. So we pray, Maghrib. It's a beautiful prayer. I'm feeling inspired, moved, the whole thing. And uh, I sit up at the end, and a woman calls me over. Sister, 
You know you have to do that again, right? Oh? You had one piece of hair showing. Allah won't accept your prayer. You have to do that again. Really? Hmm. What I would never tell you about Islam is that 9-11 returned me to my faith. Running back as fast as I could beneath rubble, dead rubbery bodies and lies because the truth was being skewed and I knew better. I stay in Islam because there is no racism in the Ummah. Because the words of the Almighty make my insides warm and bright and I know there is room for me. I stay in Islam because a woman who can prepare for her own death knows best and her path is savory. Islam has not turned its back on me. It's the people who interpret it. Yes, I struggle. I struggle between listening to humans, imams, and Allah. What I would never tell you about Islam is that I don't do it correctly, but you don't actually know that. The lines between being Muslim and my Afghan culture are blurred, but you don't actually know that. I haven't always believed. Sometimes I wonder if praying five times a day will actually bring me closer to God. Sometimes I forget my prayers and how many rakats I'm supposed to do. I don't really get the difference between Sunnis and Shiites, really. What's a dervish, actually? And when I pray, it's me and the rug and my slipping veil. Am I facing the right direction? Am I my third or fourth rakat? When I pray, it's always the same order. Maudad Boba, Zadi Sangi, and Adam, my brother. For our health, wealth, love, and fulfillment. Then Maudad side of the family, Boba side of the family, my dead grandparents and all the Muslim martyrs. No, the entire Muslim world. For, their, for our health, wealth, love, and safety. No, scratch that, all of humanity. When I pray, it's a conversation, a running list of praise, thank yous, and shukrans. When I pray, it's on 11-11, 333, 11-11, And what I would never tell you about Islam, or my Islam, is that I pray for Catholics. Reach out, touch faith. If I weren't a queer Muslim, I couldn't be part of the amazing community to which I belong and to which I cling fiercely. Things I wouldn't have if Allah hadn't made me a queer Muslim. Salam wouldn't have opened her heart to tell me about the atheist woman she is with. I wouldn't have recognized and loved Nuria's Texas Desi swag. I wouldn't have heard Sadia's amazing song telling us when you hear the sound of my voice, be here with me, assuring us of collective survival and thriving. I wouldn't be able to put my finger on the courage, renewed moment to moment of Farouk, encouraging women to lead Salat, wearing his tight shirts and pink kufis. I wouldn't be able to hold D as my sister from another mister. I wouldn't have my earthly beloved Fatima I wouldn't be able to weep for the simple joy of seeing all of us who made it to the LGBT Muslim retreat and all whose spirits met us there. I breathed in this community in a way I don't breathe anywhere else. Praying shoulder to shoulder, person to person, head beside head, was one of the most beautiful expressions of love for Allah. La ilaha illallah, ya Allah. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, can we ever zikr enough?
So all of my lovers or daters have always given me um, advice. Um, they've offered me advice on coming out to my family. This is my advice to all those lovers and daters out there, general lovers and daters of queer Muslims. Dear Boo, my family is not your struggle, at least not to take on and fix or rationalize them. Ooh, I'm blinding you. I need your support, unflinching, untimed, without judgment, with no shelf life. They won't fall in love with you if you wield your cultural sensitivity and then accept us. This isn't some eat, pray, love, landmark transformation we're going to get. And my back does not bend that far back. It's great that you were, be, you were able to be steadfast and proud about your queerness, your short hair, or for your family to accept your ex-girlfriend and let you sleep in the same bed with you when you visited them for Christmas. It doesn't work like that for me, and I don't expect it to. Some things are not going to fly here, not now, and not with them. I wish they could meet you and be charmed the way I was. My success is unlike the ways you're used to. It's listening to their stories and memories, even after being kicked out of the house. And no, no baby. I can't tell him how I'm feeling and why I'm scared of them. And that when you do this, it makes me feel this sort of formula doesn't work for me or with them. I can't tell you how to understand them. There are so many ways I don't know them. Knowing what it's like to have literally walked miles and miles across the border of your homeland, swollen feet entering new lands in search of a better life, and then this. Living in a world where people only see you by your accent or your suspicious mustache. Walking away from home, knowing somewhere inside that the next time you'll be back there is to be buried. And so, lover, I understand them without words. And I can't always justify to you why I'm not mad at them and why I'm okay with what seems to be the status quo. Success is them knowing I'm not who they wanted and I'm still invited home. It's when I can answer your phone call in their presence. Our success is in sharing space. I have no benchmarks or pebbles to follow, just openings where it doesn't hurt as much. And I know we've made it one step farther with my father. And success is when I hear Boba talk about the fall of dictators and I know you too share the same working class revolutionary spirit. Lover, I love you. You are my family too. And I want so much for all my families to come together. I just don't know how that will happen or when. But I ask you to love them for all that they are and all that they are not, as you love me. When I grow my heart, I sing like I've been in a high-class choir for a lifetime, toned and honed. When I grow my heart, you'd hardly see my face such as the shine of me, and I am cheesy in delight and hungry 
to hold on to moments, remembering how you rubbed my back, how indescribably cute you looked with the hood of your sweatshirt pulled up around midnight, bleary-eyed and committed. I love you. When I grow my heart, California beckons like a mirage. I will grow a garden there, an orchard, a child, a wife, a life, or at least plant an avocado tree. So I would like to invite um, anyone who knows the Fatiha to join us. We're doing it in the round. So I'm going to start, and uh, Wazina's going to come in on the second Rahman Rahim. And I invite anyone who would like to, um, to follow that and join in on her third um, or second Rahman Rahim. Bismillah, Rahman Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Rahman Rahim, Maliki Yomidin. Iyaka na'udu wa iyaka nasta'in. Ikhdina surat al-mustakeen. Surat al-ladhina namta alayhim. Ghayli al-maktubi alayhim.